Okay. okay. That's it, I think. In fact, walk hard. Don't let any more people give you requests. I think they have two, three minutes. Let them come and give it to me. Okay. Nick, just tell people outside they can come in if they're waiting outside. Okay, the usual rules apply. You know that already that there are two quizzes, so I can't tell you what answer goes with which one until I've looked at your quiz. But very quickly, this was, I, I remember when my son first took algebra. Oh, he's gone already, so give it to me. It took an extra three minutes, yeah. My, first, my, my son first took his, uh, took his first algebra class. I remember him coming home and saying, Dad, what's the point of this class? And I said, Kieran, uh, your whole life is an algebra problem. The only problem in life is you have one equation and two unknowns. Be happy you're actually doing an algebra class where there's one equation and one unknown. And this was a quiz where you really had algebra problems in each of them. In what sense? I mean, if I told you A plus B is equal to C, then if I give you A and C, you got B, right? Think of problem three. What did I give you? I gave you the consolidated. And I gave you the parent. Think of the algebra. Parent plus sub is equal to consolidated, right? So if you have the consolidated and the parent, you can get the sub. It's actually almost exactly the same problem from like three years ago where I gave you the consolidated and the sub in that problem. Here I just gave you the consolidated and the parent, but it's, you know, you subtract one out from the other. The second problem, the big unknown was the return on capital, right? But what did I give you? I gave you the growth rate, it was in the prom already, that's why I gave you the income, and I gave you the reinvestment rate each year, because it's the same reinvestment rate each year. Growth times is equal to reinvestment rate times return on capital, you have two, you can back out the third one. On the first prom, what's invested capital each year? It's invested capital from the previous year plus the reinvestment this year. So if I gave you the, and that was the significance of that total invested capital that I Said, and I said, if you don't get it, you're in big trouble on this problem already, you know, because it's a change in the invested capital that makes a reinvestment each year. Now, I know you brought your toolkit to play. That sales to capital ratio, you used it in so many problems. You wanted to use it here. You don't need it. You saying, what about growth time, no times return? Can I use that? You don't need it. You already have the reinvestment. Why go looking for trouble, right? So I'll grade the quizzes and I will tell you when the quizzes are ready to pick up with the solutions and you can check out the solutions. I will be kind. I'm always kind when I grade. I'm looking, I mean, you might not believe this, but I'm looking for ways in which I can give you credit for what you know. I'm not looking for ways in which I punish you for what you don't know. So I'm bending over backwards at each stage and maybe you meant this. And I'm assuming the best possible scenario as to how you got there. The third problem was a mess. It always is. Any cross-holding problem in, through the history of my quizzes always gives people trouble. You add when you subtract. You should be subtracting. You subtract when you should be adding. You double subtract sometimes. Sometimes You double add sometimes. It's the nature of the game. So when you get the problem back, check the solutions. Because it is something we need to get nailed down as we go through valuation. So today we're actually going to start on pricing. So I thought I'd start my session not by going directly to packet two, but by asking for your help. Winter's coming. And I absolutely hate winter. I mean, I grew up in a part of the world where 90 degrees was a cool day. Not 90 degrees Celsius, but 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And my wife's from Marin, and every winter, this is the conversation we have. This is it. This is the last winter. And I've hit my, my limit. I'm, this is about my second to last winter. And we're looking for houses. And I let my wife pick the part of the country we should move to, and that was a mistake because she picked La Jolla. <laughs> you couldn't pick California. It's an expensive state to begin with. Why you would pick the most expensive part of the most expensive state, I don't know, but this is La Jolla. Let me pull up a house, and you're going to see, what's this got to do with pricing? You're going to see in a minute why it's got to do something with pricing.
So let me pull up a house. I don't even know where this house is. 475 Marine Street. And you can pull this up for any part of the country. You pull up, so this is a Zillow page. And you go down, there is a price listed. 2.9 million. Cheap house by La Jolla standards. Now let me ask you a question. How did the realtor come up with that? Somebody put a number on this house, right? 2.9 million or 2.87, 2.895 million. I don't know why they do that little game of it looks cheap if it's 2.895, it's less than 2.9. How did the realtor come up with the 2.895 million? They looked at other houses, and this is part of the expertise that you pay 6% of your price for, right? The appraisal that the realtor brings. If you've ever looked at a Zillow page for a, for a, for a house, so there's actually an interesting number further down that some of you might have checked. It's a Z estimate. 2.81 million. How does Zillow actually has a Z estimate on every house? It's amazing. Even houses that are not up for sale, you can go down your neighborhood and check each house, and it'll give you Z estimate, Z estimate. There must be some amazing group of analysts at Zillow sitting down and estimating values, right? What does Zillow do? It does exactly what the realtor does, but it does it statistically. It says seven houses in the neighborhood in the last three months. We're going to extrapolate. It's actually getting pretty close, and you don't have to pay Zillow 6% of your... Do you, you see what's coming in real estate? The game is going to start to change, because what we needed the realtor for, we don't need that realtor for anymore, as much. So that 6% is going to become 4%, is going to become 3%. It's almost destined to happen. At least three people in this class are valuing Zillow. This is a huge market. That's its big... It's a total market is huge, but the way you're going to make money is also going to change. You're not going to be getting 6% of the proceeds in perpetuity. That number is going to come under assault because, but it's pricing. Nobody's sitting there doing a discounted cash flow valuation of each house and saying, you know what, the free cash flows the firm discounted back gave me 2.895 million. It's all pricing all the time. Let me give you a second example. I don't even know what that was. You know, somebody's phone is talking. Um, any Alabama or LSU fans here? No? What are you, NYU Violet fans now? <laughs> I've never been able to get into that part of NYU. I've never been to an NYU sports event. I don't even know where they happen. Um, but let's face it, Alabama football is big, right? It's going to be a big game, Alabama, LSU. Could be UCLA, USC, if it were me. It, you know, whatever your college was, it wasn't NYU. You have a college team you can pull for. It could be Michigan, Ohio State. And odds are the game sold out. You got to buy tickets. You got to get online. And you have all these seats. I mean, all this StubHub and you know, Ticket City and all. The, one of my favorite sites used to be, and I'll tell you in a minute why it used to be. It's a site called SeatGeek. It's an, it aggregates all these different sites. And what makes it interesting is if you go into any section, in this case I pick one section, section H because you want to be around the 50-yard line, and I look up prices, it lists the tickets available for sale. I'm saying, what's the big deal? It also ranks the tickets based on how good this deal is. So the higher that number, the better the deal. This is amazing. How the heck do they do it? Do you see how they do it? What, why is the best deal the best deal here? What do they do? What do you think they did? They compared the price to other seats in the same section. At $469, you're getting a great deal because the other seats in that section sell for a lot more. And you can get, I'm, I'm sure they have levels of sophistication. Row 1, for instance, should sell for more than row 10. So what SeatGeek has built is this neat little computer program that compares across a section, because obviously if you're in the end zone, you can't compare to somebody in the middle, and comes up with these rankings. In fact, they rank them from amazing to awful. The reason though, and this is I think relevant to pricing again, I don't use SeatGeek anymore, is StubHub has pulled their tickets off SeatGeek. And StubHub accounts for about 35% of all the seats that are sold in that, in that secondary market. 
Now do you see why pricing is going to be affected? If I let you price on only 65% of the listings rather than 100%, I might be getting a skewed judgment as to what's cheap, what's expensive. So today we're going to start thinking about pricing, and I want you to think about these two examples. Because in a sense, this is classic pricing. The reason it works is a seat in this section is very much the same as another seat in the same section, though separated by rows. It's easy to do pricing here because the seats are homogeneous once you've got it by section. It's relatively easy to price real estate because I'm not comparing a La Jolla house to a Sacramento house to a Fresno house. The Fresno house is always going to look cheap because real estate in Fresno is much cheaper than... So doing pricing in real estate is relatively simple. Today we're going to talk about how people price stocks and you're going to see already why pricing with stocks gets to be significantly more difficult than either of these examples. So let's open up packet two. If you don't have it, don't worry, get it soon. Okay. And let's talk about pricing. So let's break it down. To price something, here's what you need. First, you need to tell me what's similar out there, right? With Seat Geek, it was other seats in the same section. With a La Jolla house with other houses in La Jolla. With stocks, it's got to be other stocks that you say are just like your stock. So that's the first step in pricing, is finding other assets that are like yours. And already you can see why pricing stocks is going to be more difficult than pricing seats for the Alabama LSU game. Second, unlike a seat where the price per seat is you get a seat, Price per share is, in a sense, almost arbitrary. You say, how can it be arbitrary? We have to spend an entire class on value. Remember that value for equity that you got? The way you got to a value per share is you did what? You divided by the number of shares outstanding. Can I change that overnight? What happens if I do a stock split? My 100 million shares becomes 200 million, right? Or I can make it a seven for one stock split like Apple did. And all of a sudden, I've increased the number of shares sevenfold. So my price per share is, in a sense, a number I cannot compare across companies. Because if I do, what's the most expensive stock in the US market? Berkshire Hathaway. And what's the cheapest stock? Some penny stock you shouldn't even be touching, right? If you compare price per share, it's completely arbitrary. So what do you need to do? You need to standardize that price. Sounds fancy, right? What does that mean? I have to divide the market price by something that I can compare. I can divide by earnings, I can divide by book value, I can divide. So you can, when, whenever I use a multiple, I'm just using a standardized price. In fact, even in real estate, you sometimes see standardized prices in commercial real estate. In, in residential real estate, it's kind of silly. It's a price per bedroom, right? Because when you look at houses, you don't rank. Them. But if you're buying commercial real estate, you'll often see price per square foot. Because a three-story building will sell for less than a 30-story building because you have more square, f square feet in the 30-store in, in the building. So you standardize the price. So you've got comparable, or what you call, told me were comparable assets. You've standardized the price. You've got multiples. You compare your company to those, and then you tell me a story. You pick up any sell-side equity research report. You're going to see all three ingredients. You'll see a multiple that the analyst says, this is my multiple, EV to EBITDA, EV to sales, price to earnings, price to book. You're going to see a group of 15 companies that the analyst says are comparable companies, and you've got to take him at his word. And then you have a story. So yesterday, I put up my valiant pricing as evaluation of the week. I kind of came to no conclusion there, because it's neither here nor there, because in some multiples it looks cheap, some it looks expensive. And that's one of the problems with pricing, is if you have a strong bias towards or against Valiant, you're going to find in those numbers a justification. You'll pick the right multiple to back your story. You'll pick the right comparables to back your story. And you say, hey, my story makes sense. So let's talk about pricing. But before I go there, I want to go back and revisit a statement I made in the very first class. I made a confession in the first class. I said, we're going to spend a lot of time in intrinsic valuation. We've spent 15 sessions of a 25-session class. I know there's a 26th session, but that last session is for review and project analysis. So I've spent 60% of this class on intrinsic valuation. 
But I made a statement at the very first class that most of what you see passing for valuation out there is really pricing. Let me back up that statement. About 10 years ago, or maybe long enough, 15 years ago, I collected about 550 sell-side equity research reports from around the globe, different sectors, different investment banks, different countries. I must confess I didn't read all of them. That would have been torture. I collected them because I wanted to chronicle how sell-side equity research analysts approached investing. Out of the 550 equity research reports, 45, 45 were intrinsic valuations. That's less than 10%. 450 were pricing, multiples and comparables. You think, what about the other 55? They were quite scary. No idea what they were. Search for self, psychological profiling, all kinds of stuff, anything but equity research. But among the ones I could categorize, 10 to 1, pricing outnumbered valuation equity research. I said, maybe it's different in corporate finance. So I was able to get my hands on about 100 acquisition valuations done by investment banks. And these are very difficult to get your hands on because when an investment bank does a valuation of an acquisition, it goes into a folder inside another folder inside a third folder. It's locked up because they don't want anybody to ever see that forecasted number on which the acquisition was based. But I have my sources. I got 100 acquisition valuations, most of them on the slide. And here it looked almost 50-50, that half were discounted cash flow valuations and half were pricing, until I took a closer look at the discounted cash flow valuations and I discovered they were really pricing in drag. When we talked about Trojan horse valuations, in other words, they look like discounted cash flow valuations. They're all the terminology of discounted cash flow valuation, but the biggest number, the terminal value, came from six times EBITDA. Where did that come from? From looking at other companies trading at right now. So most of what you see out there is pricing. And that initially at least, you know, was a, it puzzled me initially as to why, because I don't know whether you remember, but around the second session, after I described the three approaches to valuation, intrinsic, valuation pricing, and real options, I asked you to tell me which of these you would use as your primary approach. And it was a little unfair because you hadn't taken the class yet. I'm going to ask you that same question at the end of this class, in the 26th session. And in the 26 years I've been teaching this class, when I ask that question, the answer I get back from this class over the 26 years is, can be broken down to 70, 20, and 10. 70% 70 of the people leaving this class tell me that they're true believers in intrinsic valuation. About 20% say, I like this pricing stuff. It's much simpler, much more straightforward. And 10% become believers in efficient markets after they've actually had trouble valuing a company. They say, hey, the market's not that stupid. This is really tough to do. Maybe I should just buy index funds. A very healthy recognition early on that will save you a ton of money down the road. But among those people who pick a valuation approach and they leave this room 7 to 2, they say they're going to do intrinsic valuation in investing. I've never done a follow-up survey five years later, but I'll wager that five years later I came to you and asked you, what are you doing in your job? How are you approaching putting a number in a company? I'll wager the numbers will get switched. So that led to some soul searching. What is it that happens between the time people leave my class and what happens on your desk that leads you to go from being a true believer in intrinsic valuation to a pricer? And I have three possible answers, and feel free to add to this list as to why so many people out there, much as they like the talk of intrinsic valuation, are really pricers. The first came to me when I was watching a Seinfeld episode. You've all seen Seinfeld, right? The quintessential New York sitcom. In an episode, one of Jerry's girlfriends accuses him of being crazy. He says, Jerry, you're crazy. And he says, if you think I'm crazy, you should see the guy who lives across the hall from me. Yeah. Talking, of course, about... Kramer, relative to Kramer, who's crazy? He's saying, what's this got to do with pricing? We forget how much evaluation is selling. We think of valuation as analysis, right? But almost, if you think about that realtor, why is she attaching a number to the house? Not to feel good about it, but because she wants to sell the house. Why does a banker put a number on a target company? Because he or she wants to get the deal done. It's far easier to sell something with a pricing than it is to sell it with an intrinsic valuation. 
Okay, let me give you an example. I know, I know you probably don't remember this, but in the last session I did an evaluation of Amgen. I concluded that it was cheap at $55 per share. So I've done that research on a Friday. Monday morning I call you, you're a portfolio manager, I'm an equity research analyst. I say, you should buy Amgen, it's cheap. And you ask me why, and say, well I used a reinvestment rate of 60% and a return on capital of 16%, I came up with a growth rate of 9.6%, I used a beta 1.73, and I came, by now you've hung up the phone, who has the time for this at 8 o'clock on a Monday morning? So let me try a different pitch on you. Amgen looks cheap, it's trading at nine times earnings, everything else trades at 15 times earnings. A remarkably unsophisticated pitch, but the hook gets in, right? You pick the multiple, you pick the right comparables, you can tell me whatever story you want. Your cholesterol is 300, not too bad. Relative to people who've died of heart attacks in the last week, you look really good. It, all it depends on is your frame of reference, right? Real estate in La Jolla looks expensive, right? But relative to real estate in London, it looks cheap. Everything has a comparison if you compare it to the right group. So pricing works much better if your job is transacting, if it's selling. That's why you will not see valuation. If you're going to work at an investment bank, my sympathies, but you will not see valuations in investment banks. And it's, no, it's not because they're not smart enough to do it. It doesn't make sense for them because they have to get transactions done to make money. And if your job is to get transactions done, you are going to price things. Second reason why people like pricing. When you do evaluation, all your assumptions are out there for people to pick apart, right? So when I put my Uber valuation up two weeks ago, people said, I don't like your total market. I don't think they'll do this. Why is your cost of capital this? And every number was out there for people to say, I don't like that, I don't like that, I like that. In contrast, if I said, I'm valuing Uber at six times your 10 EBITDA. What are you going to pick at? You don't like the six times? Take a look at these other companies, they all traded six times EBITDA. I'm giving your target this small to hit. So when I use a pricing, if you don't like it, I say, take it up with the market. It's not my fault. And there's a third reason why I think people go with pricing. I believe that in the long term, you're going to be more often correct with intrinsic valuation than pricing. That comes from my faith. But I'm not saying 100%. You're probably going to be right 60% as opposed to 51% or 52%. But here's the catch. When you're wrong with intrinsic valuation, you're going to be wrong alone. You think, so what? You know what happens to people who are wrong alone? They lose their jobs. First rule on Wall Street is if you're going to screw up, have lots of company. You know how you end up with having lots of company? You do pricing and you overprice everything and everything collapses. You say, don't blame me, everybody else was doing it. It's a survival mechanism. So what I'm trying to say is, don't fight this. Don't be one of these crazy people who says, I'm an intrinsic value person, I'm going to do intrinsic. If your job requires you to price things, you've got to price it. And it's a realization that I didn't come to right away. When I first started teaching this class, I used to try to push people away from pricing to valuation. I don't try anymore because that might be what your job requires. So for the next four sessions, what we're going to talk about is we're going to price things. Let's at least do that right. Let's use all the data, not the average for the sector, and just move away. So one of the things I'm going to argue for is even if you're a believer in intrinsic valuation, you need to understand the pricing process. You need to understand it, not just because the people you're working with might be prices. They understand multiples. They don't understand intrinsic value. But what do you need to have happen for you to make money as an intrinsic value person? The price has to move towards a value. So I think it's incredibly short-sighted to say, I'm a value person. I don't care about that pricing thing. But how the heck are you going to make money if you don't understand how prices move towards value? So I call that the market imperative. Nobody can ever ignore the market and say, I don't care what the market thinks because ultimately you are at the mercy of the market and you've got to understand how the market prices things. So what I'm actually going to do is essentially start by laying out the basics of multiples. And let's face it, there are dozens and dozens of multiples. Price earnings, price to book, EV to EBITDA, EV to sales. And it's easy to get overwhelmed by saying, hey, there are 25 multiples, which one do I use? If you boil it down to basics, and this is stating the obvious, might as well state it. Every multiple has a numerator and a denominator, right? 
In the numerator, you always will have to have a market-based number. That market-based number can be just the market value of your equity, market capitalization. It can be the market value of your entire firm, which will be market value of equity plus market value of debt, the people cheat and use book value of debt. Or it can be the market value of what's called the operating assets of the company, which will be market value of equity plus market value of debt minus cash. That's called enterprise value. But they're all three are market values, that's in the numerator. So numerator always has to be a market-based number. In the denominator, you could divide by revenues. Why? Because you might be desperate. Desperate in what sense? You look down the income statement, everything is negative. For a multiple to work, the denominator has to be positive. So if you look in a young startup, you might use revenues because that's the only thing you have. But what if you have a company like Snapchat that doesn't even have revenues? Then you get really, really desperate. You look for things that might lead to revenues in the future, like what? Subscribers, downloads, users, apps, whatever you need to. So you can have market value divided by revenues or revenue drivers. You can have earnings. Either to equity investors, which would be net income, earnings per share, or it can be to the firm, which would be operating income. You could have cash flows in a very rough sense. It can be cash flows to equity. It can either be free cash flow to equity, just net income plus depreciation, or cash flows to the firm, either the free cash flow to the firm or just EBITDA. It's a very rough measure of cash flow. Remember, you're no longer playing in the intrinsic value world anymore. You can say, that's not right. You're just scaling it to something. You can scale it to whatever you want. You can also scale it to what accountants tell you this company is worth, right? Book value of equity, or book value of equity plus book value of debt, or what's called invested capital, what we've been playing with in this kind of case, which is book value of equity plus debt minus cash. So you've got a numerator and a denominator. So when, next time you look at a page of multiples, take one and kind of take it apart and look at what's in the numerator, what's in the denominator, because here are the four steps to using multiples well. The first is we're going to start off by defining a multiple. You see, I know what the PE ratio is. Do you? Let's talk about it. Maybe your definition of PE and my definition of PE are very different things. We're going to pass the multiple through a couple of tests to make sure it's going to work. Then we're going to describe the multiple. Sounds fancy, right? Remember histograms and statistics? What do you do in a histogram? You just count. How many companies have PE ratios less than four? Four to eight, eight to 12. I'm going to put up a histogram of every multiple that I can find for every company that I can compute the multiple for. And you're going to see some very interesting statistical properties of multiples that if you ignore, can screw you up. Then we're going to analyze the multiple. Sounds fancy again, but here's what we're going to do. I'm going to argue that embedded in every multiple are all the assumptions you're running away from in discounted cash flow evaluation about growth and risk. You thought you didn't have to make them. You're just making them implicitly rather than explicitly. So I'm going to make it explicit. So I'm, at the end of that process, when you say, I want to use a price to book, I'm going to say, these are the four variables that you need to control for. And only then am I ready to use a multiple. Define, describe, analyze, apply. My problem with multiples is not that people use them, but that they're incredibly sloppy about the way they use them. They're in a hurry to get to that PE ratio. They don't want to stop and ask, define, describe, analyze, apply. If you follow this four-step process, not only will you be able to understand the eight multiples we go through, but you will have a framework where if I give you a multiple you've never seen before, you have exactly the process for taking it apart. So one way to think about what we're going to be doing in these next four days is I'm going to give you enough ammunition to stop that broker who's been bugging you for the last five years with recommendations from ever calling you again. Because when he calls you, he says, I have a great stock for you. Price to book of 0.75. I'll give you the four questions, or you will be able to come up with the four questions. If you ask that guy by the end of the fourth question, say, I'm never calling this guy again. He knows too much. <laughs> and it's not that complicated. That's the part of the pricing process I want you to take away is to know what questions to ask an analyst, an investor, a venture capitalist to make sure you're not being taken for a ride. So let's start with the definitional test. Whenever I look at a multiple, these are the first two questions to ask. Is this multiple consistently defined? Let me explain. I said every multiple has a numerator and a denominator, right? Here's the first rule with multiples. If your numerator is an equity value, your denominator should be an equity value too. If your numerator is a firm or an enterprise value, your denominator has to be a firm or an enterprise value as well. It sounds incredibly abstract, but let's try a couple of multiples. Let's take PE ratio. What's in the numerator? 
equity value, enterprise value, firm value. Equity value, right? Earnings per share, equity value, firm value, enterprise value. Thank God for small blessings. The most widely used multiple in the world passes the test. Numerator is an equity value, denominator is an equity value. So P ratios pass the test. How about EV to EBITDA? What's in the numerator? Enterprise value, which is value of the operating assets, right? An estimate value of equity plus debt minus cash. Denominator, you have EBITDA. A measure of cash flow, absolutely a bore, but still a measure of cash flow to operating assets. So EV to EBITDA is okay too. What about price to EBITDA? The analyst invented this multiple should be tarred, feathered, and driven out of the fraternity if there is one. It's a horrible multiple. Out of those 550 equity research reports, seven used price to EBITDA. One of them happened to be somebody who took this class 15 years ago. So I called him. <laughs> he said, who is this? He said, remember that valuation class you took at that time six years ago? He said, vaguely. I said, it shows. I said, what the heck are you doing? Dividing price by EBITDA, it's not consistent. He said, no, no, I'm being consistent. I said, what do you mean you're being consistent? He said, I use price to EBITDA for all 15 companies in my sector. I said, it's a very weird definition of consistency. And then I asked him a follow-up question. I said, have you been noticing that companies with a lot of debt in your sector keep looking cheap to you? He says, yes, yes, I've been noticing that. I said, have you ever stopped and thought about why that might be? Do you see the connection? What's in your numerator? Market value of equity, right? Let's play a game. Let's say I go out and borrow $15 billion and buy back shares. I'm allowed to do that, right? So what's going to happen to my market value of equity overnight? It's going to shrink by roughly $15 billion. Maybe by only $14 billion, but it's going to be a lot smaller. What's happening to my EBITDA? It's earnings before interest. And that I can borrow money till the cows come home and die in the yard somewhere, and it's still the same EBITDA. Before you feel too superior to this person, if you've ever used price to sales or let somebody use it on you, you are guilty of the same sin, right? And you'd be amazed at how many equity research reports I, say, I see that use market cap divided by revenues. And you know why they've been able to get away with it? What's the sector you see price to sales used most frequently? Technology. And why do you get away with it? Because they've tended to have no debt. But you know what's creating a problem even there? Even though you have no debt, when I take the market cap of Apple, there is the market cap of the company. It includes the software, the smartphone, etc. What else is in there? $200 billion in cash, right? It's going to bias you away from firms which have a lot of cash and towards firms that have no cash because of nothing else, holding everything else constant. I'm going to get a much lower price to sales ratio for companies with no cash. So check for consistency. You're going to be amazed at how many multiples will fail the test. Second follow-up question, is that multiple estimated exactly the same way for all 15 companies? It's a tough test to meet because when you use price earnings ratio, what I'm asking you, are you using the same accounting standards? That's the first level of the test. Which means if I'm comparing 15 companies across countries, I might already have an issue. You're saying, thank God, I'm looking at only Gap. But you can have the same accounting standards and different degrees of fidelity to those standards, right? Which means that your earnings per share could be higher for aggressive companies and lower for conservative companies. So is it uniformly estimated? And that's one of the reasons you have to be terrified of what analysts are doing to earnings, right? Where they add back stock-based compensation and they add back for a value and they were adding back the acquisition-based cost. It's become almost a game where 15 companies, if you wanted, you can make any company look cheap by just adding back stuff. You don't want to subtract it out in the first place. So is it consistently estimated? I'm sorry, is it consistently defined, uniformly estimated? So let's try this on a few multiples. I already told you PE ratio was consistently estimated. Numerator is an equity value. Everybody knows what the P-E ratio is, right? So the one multiple where everybody, even people who are novices, even Anna Kornikova seemed to know what the P-E ratio was. Do you guys remember Anna Kornikova? She masqueraded as a tennis player for like a decade. Won nothing but it was in every commercial you could think of. 
This was actually a commercial made by Charles Schwab. I almost, I'm a Charles Schwab customer, I almost terminated my account right after this commercial came out. Where Anna Kornikova in the commercial is playing somebody, must have been an actress, she was actually winning. So in tennis, you know how every two games you've got to switch sides. So Anna and this actress are passing each other by. I don't know why this would come up in the middle of a tennis match. Anna turns to the actress and says, price earnings ratio is price divided by earnings per share. And then she went on to say something about preferred dividends and went completely over my head. So I turned off the TV and remember thinking, does Anna Kornikova really know what the PE ratio is? I know the numerator is usually the current price. Unless you've got one of those technical analysts gone crazy, you know the ones I'm talking about who love moving averages for everything? They use a moving average price. If you ever run into somebody who uses a moving average price, here's the question to ask them. Have you ever tried buying a stock at a moving average price? Call your broker and say, I'd like to buy a stock at a 52-week moving average, please. Doesn't work. But usually it's the current price. It's in the denominator that you get the real game playing, right? I can divide by earnings per share in the most recent fiscal year, which for most of us is going to be 2014, which will be current PE. I can divide by earnings per share in the last four quarters, which is through probably June of 2015, trailing PE. I can divide by expected earnings per share in the next four quarters, which will be forward PE. I can divide by earnings per share in the year 2016, which is also called forward P, which is very confusing. Or I can divide by earnings per share in the year 2025, which is really, really forward P. Why would I do that? Desperation drives me to do strange things. I'm the biotech analyst. Nothing in my sector is making money. The only tool I have is P. I am completely and totally screwed. So here's what I do. I project out the earnings per share for every company 10 years out and say, this company looks cheap. It's trading at six times 2,025 earnings. And you have no idea what that even means. But while you're scratching your head, they sold, sell you the stock and move on. It could be earnings per share before extraordinary items, after extraordinary items. Before employee option expensing, after employee option expensing. Before st so you could take any high profile company today and probably write 35 different PE ratios for this company today all of which you can legitimately call a PE ratio, but the numbers are going to be wildly different. I remember doing this for Cisco about five years ago, and I got PE ratios ranging from 19 to 60, depending on how I define earnings per share. You think, so what? If I have an agenda, I'm going to pick the PE ratio that best fits that agenda, right? It's often almost funny watching two analysts argue on CNBC about a high-profile company. And the PE ratios they're using are wildly divergent. The bullish guy keeps talking about the PE being only 12 times earnings. And the bearish guy says it's 65 times earnings. And the difference is one guy is using forward earnings, the other guy is using trailing earnings. One guy is adding back stuff, the other guy isn't. It's, it's agenda driven and you can see why it happens. So the next time somebody says this stock is cheap, it's PE ratio is 8. At the risk of sounding incredibly stupid as well, I don't, don't know what your definition of PE is. Can you? Let's say even Anna Kornikova knows what the PE ratio is. It's Anna's much smarter than I am. Can you please give me your definition of PE before we start talking about what's expensive or cheap? And it's amazing how many variants you will get on that model. Now, let's dig a little deeper when it comes to PE. Let's say using PE ratios to compare technology companies. And that these technology companies have wildly different numbers of options outstanding. Some have none, some have a lot. Some have in-the-money options, some have out-of-the-money options. That's the nature of the beast. And you want a PE ratio you can compare, which will be consistent. So I'm going to give you a series of definitions of price earnings ratio. And you tell me which one you will use to compare these technology companies. I can divide price by primary earnings per share, where I actually count the number of shares outstanding today. What's that going to bias you towards? Which, which kinds of companies will look cheap to you if I divide price by primary earnings per share? Companies with a lot of options outstanding or companies with no options outstanding? A lot of options, and tell me why. What's going to happen when you have a lot of options outstanding? The market cap will reflect it, so the price per share will come down because people know there are millions of options overhanging you. If I divide by the earnings per share today, I'm going to see these companies looking cheap because I'm missing the option overhang. So you can cross that out. What about price by fully diluted earnings per share? You know what fully diluted means, right? I count in all the shares will be outstanding 
if these options get exercised. Do you think this is better? What's the problem here? You're treating an option as either one or zero, right? Either share or not. And if you take an option pricing, or even if you haven't done option pricing, you can have an option that's at the money, $10 in the money, $50 in the money, right? They're very different from the perspective of what effect they will have on your share count. The problem with counting it as zero or one is you could be counting out of the money options and in the money options for different companies. You're going to bias yourself against companies which have a lot of in the money op options. I'm sorry, bias yourself towards companies with a lot of out of the money options because what you're effectively going to do is not reflect that. The, the number of shares is going to increase, but the market cap is not much affected because people look at the company and say, hey, these options are never going to get exercised. So that's not going to work. What about price by partially diluted earnings per share, where you count only in the money options? Some people do that. Are all in the money options made equal? No, it could be $1 in the money, $10, $50, $100 in the money. Again, zero, one is this is a very bad place to be, primary, because that pretty much covers what analysts use. If you have options outstanding, you know what the answer is? Don't work with per share numbers. There is no easy way out. Here's what you need to do, and nobody will do this, so I'll tell you up front that this is completely unrealistic. If you want a price earnings ratio to be comparable across companies with lots of different options, you have to do what we did in DCF valuation. What do we do with options outstanding? We valued them as options, right? You'll have to value the options outstanding. You have to add that to the market cap. Do you see why you have to add it? Because that's what's been taken out of the market cap. You have to add the two together. That's going to give you the total value of equity in this company. And then you have to divide by the net income, not by per share numbers, because per share numbers cannot work if you have all these options outstanding. It's a, it's a huge problem, especially with options outstanding, to do this. And you can see why you're going to get some strange answers if you don't do it. Let's talk about EV to EBITDA, perhaps the most widely, the fastest growing multiple in use, at least, in practice. Okay, so when I started in mid-1980s, mid nobody used EV to EBITDA. And it kind of took off. And now I would say 30% of all equity research reports globally use EV to EBITDA. The definition is usually pretty straightforward. It's market value of equity. Supposed to be market value of debt, but people cheat because they say, I can't get market value. You'll see book value of debt minus cash is enterprise value in the denominator of EBITDA. Anytime I run into an analyst who uses EV to EBITDA, I ask them what I think is a very simple question. And I very seldom get the right answer to this question. I say, why do you net cash out of the numerator? So let me throw that question to you. Why do we net cash? out of the numerator when we do EV to EBITDA. Nobody? Yes? I'm sorry, what? Good. What about interest payment? You're getting interest income from cash. I, you're, you're almost almost there. You're getting interest income from cash. Think of the consistency rule. Actually, you're almost there. You do the interest income from cash. In the denominator, though, you have EBITDA, which does not include that interest income. Do you see why we take cash out? Because the income from cash is not part of the denominator. The denominator is EBITDA. That already opens a Pandora's box. You know what else we should be netting out of the numerator? If I'm computing the EV to EBITDA for Yahoo, I take the market value of equity, which is about 40 billion. I add cash, which is about 6 billion, 5 billion. Subtract that, which is 3 billion. I come up with 42 billion as enterprise value. I divide by the EBITDA today, which is less than 800 billion. I get an EV to EBITDA of 50. Yahoo looks incredibly overpriced, right? But what am I missing when I do that? We've talked a little bit about Yahoo. Alibaba and Yahoo Japan, which are cross holdings, which are minority holdings, the income from which is not part of your EBITDA, right? So your 42 billion includes the values of those holdings, so what should we be doing? We should be subtracting out the 35% of Yahoo Japan and the 15% of Alibaba 
Doing what? By either getting the market caps, if you're doing a pricing, or intrinsic values, if you don't have a pricing. Now do you see why even if even when people use EBITDA, EBITDA, you cannot avoid the problem of cross holdings? It's a consistency issue. So it's a problem we face with multiples, is being consistent. You can, and that kind of spills over into everything we do. One final example on the consistency issue. Especially since the 2008 crisis, the housing crisis, one of the questions that people looking at the housing market have asked is, how do we know collectively when housing is in a bubble? Okay. With stocks, we have P-E ratios. With bonds, we have interest rates. So what do we do with it? Because real estate, usually, especially if it's residential, there's no income to scale it to because you're buying it to live it. So one of the ideas that people came up with is you can look at the housing price and you can look at the rental income you could make by renting out the house and you can come up with a ratio of housing price to rental income. You see what you're trying to do? You're saying, is the price consistent with what I'd make if I rented this house out? My question is a very simple one. Let's say I could give you this number. And actually, there are sites that actually track this number now. In fact, if you go to the Zillow page, they'll give you both a Z estimate for your house and a Z estimate of how much you can make as rental income on the house. So you could compute what that ratio is in La Jolla and Fresno and in New York. My question is, let's say you're comparing housing to other asset classes. Would I be comparing that ratio, if I wanted to be consistent in comparison, and I'm comparing it to stocks, would I be comparing it to a price earnings ratio, an EV to sales, an EV to EBIT, or an EV to EBIT? First, wh why not price earnings? Why, why am I not comparing to price earnings? What's the numerator of my housing ratio? The value of the house. Not the value of the equity in the house, but the value of the house. So I've got to compare to EV. And then I'm dividing by rental income, which is actually my income before I cover depreciation. So actually, there is an argument that if you're going to do this comparison, it should be EV to EBITDA because it's the closest thing you can get to it. So stocks are trading at an EV to EBITDA of eight, and houses are trading at 12 times EBITDA. Very loosely speaking, you'd argue houses are overpriced relative to stocks. I wouldn't go that far, but you can see the kind of comparison you'd have to make. One final point, and then we'll end for the day. When we start next session, what I'm going to do is ask you to, to review your statistics. Very basic stuff. Because the skill set you need to understand multiples is statistics. Because the problem you face in statistics is you have huge amounts of data pulling you in different directions, and you've got to make sense of large and contradictory databases. Statistics was made for pricing. In fact, if I had my druthers, every statistics class would be taught around multiples and comparables. Because the payoff from the class then is you might actually make some money on the class. Rather than comparing weights of people to what they eat, who cares? Right? So when we start on Monday, we're going to bring basic statistics to the game. It'll be money ball applied to stocks. Okay? So see you on Monday. Something with those numbers, my my estimate, my my the the price per share you should be getting should be about one hundred and twenty dollars per share. Would you mind if I like send you the? Send me the valuation. It might be something, some tweak in the model that's causing it, because fifty billion, seven and a half percent margin. 
and a sales ratio of 2.4. I have, I'm hard pressed. You might come up with a low value per share, but you shouldn't be coming up with a negative value per okay. share. So send it to me. I'll take a look at it. Maybe okay. there's something going on in the, in the inside of the market. Yeah. So if trader, if you use treasury stock for options, like I would get the different number if uh, the company buy back shares from the market or if it issues shares, like new shares, and it's going to be a little bit different numbers. Like it might be a little bit. It should be. What usually happens? Well, with the treasury stock approach to begin with, you're ignoring the option add, right? The premium, the time premium is gone. So it's actually you're assuming that options have no excess value. Yeah. So the only difference between buying back shares today and waiting is the uncertainty about what will happen to price in the future. Mm -hmm. So you're locking in the price today. Yeah. So you might get a slightly different number because of that assumption that you're locking in the price today, but both numbers are wrong because mm -hmm. both are not taking into account the time premium mm -hmm. on the option. And what, what do you usually have? Like which company is issuing new shares? Or are they depends on the company. It really depends on the company. About a third of companies buy back shares in the marketplace if they have the cash flow. So if you're a company like Microsoft in the 1990s with a lot of cash flows, you actually buy the shares back. But the kinds of companies that issue options usually do it because they don't have the cash. Yeah. And if you don't have the cash, you don't you can't buy back the shares anyway. So it's almost given the circumstances in today's market at least, the kinds of companies issuing options can't afford to buy back the shares. So it's not even a question of do you want to? You don't have the cash. That's why you're using options to begin with. So Groupon or Grubhub or, or Zillow, when they issue options, they're basically saying, we want you to work for us, you're an MBA, we know we can't pay $300,000.